So this brings us back now to the problem of demarcation. The question that Popper wanted to ask was not whether or not a theory is true or whether or not it's good. In this sense, there's a bit of a departure from that clip that I showed from, from Feynman. Uh, Feynman was at, uh, saying about whether or not theories were wrong and, uh, uh, and right, not whether or not they're scientific or non-scientific, but hopefully that, that minor uh, uh, difference doesn't, doesn't disconnect the relevancy of the, of the Feynman clip to what Popper is talking about. So yeah, so Popper isn't asking about uh, how we determine whether a theory is true, whether a theory is good, whether a theory is useful. None of those things interest him. The only question he's interested in is when should a theory be ranked as scientific and I mean it makes sense to, to realize why this is the case why this is the interesting question because science can be wrong it's it's often wrong in fact and and non-scientific ideas are often right saying a theory is em empirically verifiable is not enough to make it scientific I mean what, what do we mean by empirical after all I mean consider something like astrology this is a, a very real sense of the word in which astrology is empirical. Astrology isn't just people sitting around in rooms. They actually look up at the stars. They look at the Earth's relative position to the stars and the constellations. Uh, they, they draw upon traditions and, and literature and so forth to make their predictions. They, there is very much an empirical side of astrology. Predictions that the astrology makes, you know, at least some astrologers, are indeed verifiable. If you Again, once more, if you look for verification, if you look for confirmation of astrological predictions, you will find confirmation of astrological uh, predictions. It's not empiricism that distinguishes astrology, which is clearly not a science, it's clearly pseudoscience, from something like astronomy, which clearly is a science. If it's not empiricism that makes a difference, what is? How, do we, how are we to say that astrology is non-science or a pseudoscience and astronomy is science? Well, it's precisely this critical attitude that Popper is talking about. Probably the best way to see it is by, by taking a look at a, at a particular example that Popper loved. Einstein's theory of relativity. That is a clear example of, 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 of a scientific theory in Popper's mind. Why is that? Well, it, it wasn't because of its, impure, its mathematical eloquence. It wasn't because uh, of uh, impressive intellectual stature of Einstein. It's because Einstein's theory went out on a limb. It made very dangerous, very risky, very specific, and very radical predictions about what we should expect to find when we test the theory. Uh, the specific example of, of a prediction that Popper focused on is the idea that a massive object like a black hole or a star will bend space-time and anything passing through space-time around it. Uh, Einstein made this prediction years in advance, and it wasn't until, until several years later when Sir Arthur Eddington went out, in, you know, I think it was somewhere in Africa, uh, and observed a, a solar eclipse and was able to, to make very precise measurements and see that indeed the sun was warping the light from the stars that were behind it. So light that, you know, again, if, if, if it were moving in a straight line, would just have hit the back of the sun and so we wouldn't be able to see it. Instead, it was bending around the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gravity well that the sun was in. So we were able to see stars in places that we shouldn't have been able to see stars. Um, that's something that Newton never would have predicted. Newtonian physics never would make a prediction like that. Einsteinian physics did. Now, if Eddington had gone out there and not seen that result, it would have proved Einstein wrong, it would have falsified his idea, and we would have thrown out relativity. But it didn't prove Einstein wrong. Uh, the, the, the theory survived an attempted falsification. And that's something that makes Popper go, wow. So here we have a highly risky prediction. This isn't sort of like an obvious prediction, like I predict the sun's going to rise tomorrow. That's, that, that's, that's an obvious prediction. This is a risky prediction that other theories would not have made, that other people did not make. It's very specific, it's very testable, and when we test it, it survives. That makes it awesome. That makes it the sort of thing where we can say, look, um, uh, Einstein specified what results would be incompatible with his theory being true. To be scientific, a theory has to be incompatible with certain possible results of observation. That's a direct quote from Popper. A, good, a scientific theory is incompatible with certain possible results of observation. And to be scientific, you have to state in advance what those possible results are. You have to say, if we do this experiment and we get these results, this theory is false. This theory is wrong. Uh, that's exactly what Einstein did with relativity, and that's why relativity succeeded in being in qualifying as a scientific theory. Now, if we contrast this approach, not with astrology, which, again, I think is obviously pseudoscience, but with something else which, you know, at least 
for many people at the time Popper was writing, was arguably genuine science. Uh, 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 two theories, Marx's historical materialism and Freud's psychoanalytic theory. Um, there were genuine intellectuals at the time, you know, who, who, who thought of themselves as scientists, both Marx and Freud thought of themselves as scientists. Marx actually called himself the Isaac Newton of the social sciences, more than just a little bit of arrogance going on there on Marx's part. Um, and and there are many people who who agreed that what Marx and Freud were doing were sciences, but Popper saw them as as archetypal pseudosciences. And the reason why is because no matter what happened, no matter what data you collected, Marxists and Freudians will always see confirmation in their theories. Uh, no matter what way the experiment goes. Uh, then you know, the, uh, Marxists and Freudians are going to say, aha, see, this just shows that we're right. In, in Marx's own lifetime, there was at least five different attempted communist revolutions in the kinds of places where Marxist theory predicted there would be communist revolutions. Um, and all five of those theories were shot down. All five of those theories failed. And rather than going back to the drawing board, rather than Marx saying, hmm, maybe there's some, a problem with my theory, the way a genuine scientist would, Marx just became more convinced that he must be right. This just proves my theory is right. So if there had been a successful communist revolution, revolution, uh, that would have proved Marx was right, and there being no successful communist revolution, well, that also proves Marx right. You see the problem there? When, when your theory is compatible with any possible outcome of experiment, it is not genuinely scientific. So, I mean, again, I'll use a slightly different example here. It's more of, a, more of a caricature, but it gets to the point. You know, do you hate your job? Well, Marx is going to say that just proves that you've been alienated by capitalism. Well, what if you don't hate your job? Well, you know, that just proves that you've been brainwashed by capitalism into, into, into embracing your chains. Um, so no matter what you do, no matter whether you hate your job or you love your job, well, you've just proven Marx is right and that capitalism is bad for you. Well, what about Freud? Well, Freud says, oh, have you had a dream about your mother? Well, if you have, then that's proof that you have an Oedipal complex. Wait a minute, what if you have never had a dream about your mother? Uh, I've never in my life had a dream about my mother, you say to Freud. Freud's going to say, well, you're clearly repressing your Oedipal complex, and that shows a problem too. So no matter what you dream about, that is always proof that Freud is right. Freud will always be able to take your dream and interpret it in a way that supports his theory. And if the results of an experiment will always support your theory? That, again, that might sound like a good thing. So a lot of people say yes, that means we're going to find tons of support for the theory. But remember, you can find tons of support for any theory if you're looking at it. What you want is not a theory that can be supported by data. What you want is a theory that can be falsified by data because that shows its genuine scientific character. That shows that you're not simply falling prey to the Oedipal effect. You're not simply falling prey to dogmatic thinking. Marxists and Freudians the world over fell prey for over 100 years to that kind of... Oh, 100 years for Marx, slightly less than 100 years for Freud, to, to this kind of Oedipal effect. Pardon the double use of Oedipus here. The true believer can find evidence all the time. They will fail to realize that all they're doing is is reconfirming their own biases. And anyone who doesn't see that their theory is obviously true, well, they've just been corrupted. They've been blinded by their biases. You can always see when other people are biased, but it's a lot harder to see when you're falling prey to your own biases. And that's what the critical attitude does for us. That's what the scientific attitude does for us. It allows us to subject our own biases to critical scrutiny and force ourselves to remove and discard those biases if the experiment comes out in a particular way. So now let's come back to astrology. What is it that makes astrology a pseudoscience? Well, the problem is that astrology's prophecies are just too vague. You know, you will meet a tall, dark stranger. You know, you will ha go on an adventure. Those kind of vague predictions can never be falsified. I mean, sooner or later, yes, you will meet a tall, dark stranger. Sooner or later, you will go on an adventure. But then again, what counts as an adventure, right? I mean, that's that, that's the sort of thing that's that, that's just so open-ended that almost you're, you're guaranteed to have something that will fit that mold. Same thing's true of Marxism. Uh, Marxism made all kinds of vague predictions. Uh, you know, he said that there there would be uh, a communist revolution in, in, in industrialized countries, um, and then, you know, after Marx died, there was a communist revolution in Russia, but Russia wasn't an industrialized country, it was a largely agrarian country. So, did, did this show that Marxists were, did Marxists go, oh, well, Marx was wrong, his idea was taken, we'll have to throw it out. They, they said, no, 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 all we have to do is just sort of recognize that, that, that this, this fits perfectly with what Marx was saying by, uh, you know, making this minor modification. And Popper actually is going to give you a little bit of leeway for that, but only a little bit. That's some point I'll return to in a moment. 
Now, the psychoanalytic theories of Freud uh, did not really make vague predictions. Uh, they were they were simply untestable. There was, there was no uh, sort of way that you could perform an experiment to see whether or not someone had an Oedipal complex. That's just something that Freud read into the dreams, no matter what the dreams were. Now, I want to be clear here, Pop, because Popper is quite clear. He's not saying that theories like Marxism and Freudianism are worthless. He's not even saying that they're false. All he's saying is that they are not science. They do not deserve the praise and the honor of being called science. We can we can respect them, we can view them as sources of insight or wisdom that we might study and learn about and draw upon for various reasons. We just, we just should not confuse what Marxists and Freudians are doing with what Newton and Einstein were doing. That's what distinguishes science from pseudoscience. Uh, now, this is a hard thing for, I think, for a lot of fans of science to hear. A lot of fans of science want to say that, it's only, that so only science is intellectually respectable, but Popper did not go that far. Now, it probably makes sense here to step aside and talk briefly about uh, uh, one of the big areas in which the Popper is invoked, uh, as, you know, especially on YouTube, but, but in, in science circles and science education circles in general, and that's the debate between evolution and intelligent design. Uh, when, when Popper first published uh, his book, he actually called uh, evolution out as being uh, unfalsifiable and hence unscientific, and, and that's because Popper, well, he didn't have a very good understanding of how evolution worked when he said that. Uh, you know, he, he was trained much more in physics and much less in biology. Uh, but later in his life, when he actually had evolution explained to him, he went and he, he back and he revised that understanding, uh, and he recognized that indeed evolution uh, uh, is falsifiable. And it's it's it's, it's falsifiable and it's, it's scientific because it makes s several very specific predictions. And probably one of the most famous ones in the literature recently was the discovery of Tiktaalik. Uh, if you don't know about Tiktaalik, this was a a, a a transitional form between uh, amphibians and 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 fishes. Uh, you know, it's sort of a half fish, half amphibian. It has these sort of leg-like flippers. As it was partially in the water, partially on land. Um, uh, and, and this is a discovery that was made because of, of uh, people who were doing what's called biogeography, looking at the uh, at where they find various animals, various fossils around the world. Uh, and they noticed a bit of a hole. They said, look, there, there should be a species that fits in between these two species that we found over here, somewhere in this geographical region up here in the northern part of Canada. And after after uh, you know several digs trying to find this thing, they found Tiktaalik. Um, um, and it fit perfectly into what the theory of evolution predicted uh, uh, once it was given the, the information from biogeography. It was a very specific prediction, it was a risky prediction, and it turned out to be true. Now notice quickly something here that I'm going to bring up later. What would have happened if we hadn't found Tiktaalik? Would that have disproved evolution? Well, probably not, because, I mean, it, it's entirely possible that Tiktaalik would have still existed, but just no fossilized examples survived. So uh, that, that's, that's a bit of a foreshadowing to one of the problems that we're going to see with Popper a little bit later on. Even setting Tiktaalik aside, there's plenty of examples of discoveries that would clearly falsify Darwin's theory. Uh, probably the most famous example of this comes, I, I believe this is uh, J.B.S. Haldane's example, uh, when asked what would falsify evolution, he quipped, fossilized rabbits in pre-Cambrian strata. Um, if you don't know what that means, basically what it, what it's saying is that if finding a rabbit, which is of course a mammal and of course a vertebrate, in, in, in strata uh, before there were any vertebrates at all, much less mammals. If we found a fossilized rabbit in pre-Cambrian strata, that would be the sort of thing that would make us pay very close attention. Now, of course, we wouldn't throw it out right away. We'd say, this is, our first reaction would probably be, this is a hoax of some kind. But if we looked into it further and found that it didn't appear to be a hoax, then that would completely throw evolution for, for, for a loop. That would go a very long way to falsifying Darwin's thinking. But there's never been anything like that. Uh, quite to the, to the contrary, every, every single fossil we've ever found has fit uh, perfectly with precisely where Darwin's theory predicted we would find it in, in the strata. Contrast this with the theory of intelligent design which again claims to be a scientific alternative uh, uh, or at least augmentation to the theory of evolution. What kind of predictions does intelligent design make? Uh, well, what, that we should expect to find design in nature? Um, okay, well, that, I mean, is that a falsifiable idea? I mean, even if we expect, if we look at something and say, wow, this looks designed or this doesn't look designed, neither of those, you know, the first one could only confirm and the second one is not going to disconfirm because the claim isn't that everything in nature is designed, although some creationists might say that. And most intelligent designers are a little bit more subtle than that and they recognize they don't want to make that kind of claim. So all they're claiming is that there's going to be something in nature that is designed or that there's going to be some org aspects of organisms or some organisms that evolution can't explain. Uh, but what could falsify those claims? 
uh, those broad claims cannot possibly be falsified. Now, you can falsify specific claims of design. So when someone says something like the eye is irreducibly complex, you can falsify that by showing a clear evolutionary story with, with, with that and evidence to back it up, that it, that it is not irre irreducibly complex, that it can, did indeed evolve by slowly step-by-step -step process. So you can falsify specific claims that intelligent design makes. But ID in the broad strokes, the idea that some aspect of the biological world is inexplicable by uh, the theory of evolution and hence must be designed, there's no possible way to falsify that. We would have to literally survey and observe every single aspect of the biological world and give a complete evolutionary accounting of it. There, the, there's just not enough hours in the day. There's too much time, both uh, too much time in the past and too little time in the present to actually do that kind of exhaustive scientific study. So there is no way we could ever falsify intelligent design. Now again, once more, to be clear, Popper isn't saying this means intelligent design is false, he, nor is he saying that it's worthless. All he's saying is it's not science, and we should not confuse science with pseudoscience. That's the, that, that's the core thing that Popper is striving for here, that, that, that problem of demarcation. Okay, I want to do a quick summary here of the main conclusions of Popper's points before shifting gears and talking about some criticisms of what, what Popper is saying. So, uh, so here are some sort of preliminary conclusions. First off, confirmations for any theory can be found if you look for them. The, the, the true believer, the dogmatist, can always confirm their theories if what you're looking for is confirmation. Point two, confirmations should only count if they result from very risky predictions. If, if they're not risky, if they're common sense, again, if it's the sun will rise tomorrow, that, 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 that doesn't count for anything. Uh, confirmations only count if you're make, going out on a limb, saying something that, that, that most people or most uh, thinking uh, will, will say is unlikely to happen. It's only in those circumstances that we're going to give a confirmation any kind of weight at all. Point three. Every scientific theory needs to prohibit some things from happening. It needs to say that according to this theory, we will never find X. Uh, if it doesn't say that, then it's not scientific. Point four, a theory that is not falsifiable is not scientific. So that connects to point three in a straightforward way right there. Point five, every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify it. You should, When you test a theory, you are not trying to confirm it. You need to be trying to falsify it. Point six, you can rescue a falsified theory by retooling it. And this is, again, I foreshadowed this a second ago. Um, Popper recognizes that, that, that sometimes uh, generally good theories have minor problems which might cause problems. So he, he allows uh, scientists to say, okay, my theory's been falsified. Let me go back and try to make some changes to accommodate these problems. But you can't do that to such a degree that you, again, that you literally dodge every single possible objection. You have to say clearly and straightforwardly uh, what your parameters are, how much margin of error you're willing to allow. And, and, and in general, again, to remain scientific, you have to have fairly tight margins of error, and you have to thro throw out your ideas after enough failed experiments come back. Point seven, unfalsifiable theories aren't necessarily false or worthless, they're just not science. Again, that's something I've repeated several times now. Uh, um, it's one of the lesser known points of Popper's thinking, and it's worth stressing. Point number eight, inductive inference is a myth, at least as far as science goes. Science is not based on inductive inference. It's not based on seeing repeated patterns and then inferring those patterns and, and, and projecting them out into the future. That's not the way science works, according to Popper. Point nine, science actually operates according to conjecture and refutation, which is fundamentally deductive in nature. You say, I have a theory, or rather I have a hypothesis I'm going to put out there, and, I, and then we're going to test it, and then we're going to try to deductively falsify that hypothesis. Point ten, experiments are tests of hypotheses, that is to say that they are attempts to refute hypotheses. Point eleven, scientists believe in induction because they mistakenly thought that that, that, they're, uh, that, that was how you, you made an answer to the demarcation problem. Science works according to induction, and that's what made it, di made it successful, and hence that's why it worked in a way that pseudoscience didn't. That's incorrect. Uh, as we see, even pseudoscientific things can use induction, can be empirical, so we should not rely on induction. We should instead rely on deduction uh, by way of conjecture and refutation, because induction is an insufficient way of demarcating science from pseudoscience. Um, now, uh, point number 13 here about probabilities, I'm going to actually turn to that in just a moment, uh, as we'll see that's, that, that's going to be crucial to one of the key objections to, to Popper's thinking.